thank you, Melanie. Hey, it's it's an honor to be here. Oops. It's an honor to be here today and to be asked to give this lecture. I rarely get to talk for an hour about something I really enjoy, so I hope you enjoy it too. Um, today we'll be talking about the cactus wren. And um, when I was putting this together, um, I thought I really wanted to say something in addition to what we've learned about the cactus wren in the last several years and that informs management. I really wanted to say something about the way we've been doing it too. Um, and, and that's why I've titled this, It Takes a Region to Save the Coastal Cactus Wren, because this really has been a regional approach, and there's been many partners. And I'll go into that a little bit, because I think it is, uh, it's worked really well for us down here, and I'd like to see us try this out on some other species as we move along. Okay. So um, most of you probably know that the Cactus Wren is um, a non-migratory -migra resident uh, from southwestern United States down into central Mexico, and here in Southern California, we have two distinct um, types of populations. We uh, geographically uh, disparate those that live on the coast and those that live in the desert. And all of these populations nest in cactus. There are some cactus wrens, such as in Baja, that might use other things like palm trees and some oases and things, but here they're really restricted primarily to cactus. Occasionally they'll deviate from that. And their populations in the desert and in the coastal um, Southern California really are very different ecologically. In the desert, they inhabit desert scrub, which has a very uh, different composition of vegetation, um, a structure compared with coastal sage scrub. And there's also uh, most likely a very different arthropod community, which they're very, um, arthropods or insects are um, something that are very important for them during the breeding season. And then also, obviously, there's different climates. The desert's much hotter and uh, has, can have different patterns of precipitation, can be colder at night. And um, so th they are quite a bit different in the conditions under which they occur. Historically on the coast, they were uh, rather widespread and patchily abundant. It depended on where the occurrence of cactus was because th they are confined to that for nesting. However, um, there's been a real dramatic decline in the last few decades, and this is largely attributed to um, development, urban development, and also we've had some catastrophic wildfires and um, that have just um, blown through their habitat. And um, most of you know this, but I just wanted to emphasize that um, the way we're conserving the cactus wren is through natural community conservation plans here in um, Southern California. And this was uh, this type of uh, multiple species planning and multiple habitat planning was started in 1999 with the passage of the Natural Community Conservation Planning Act. And the primary objective of the um, NCCP, as we call it for short, is um, to conserve uh, natural communities at the ecosystem scale while accommodating compatible land use. And this involves um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the State Department, and Fish and Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service working with stakeholders, and those would be the developers, the jurisdictions, um, environmental organizations, scientists, and so on, to develop plans that um, will conserve multiple species and multiple habitats and yet allow compatible growth. For the cactus wren, we started these plans um, at the very beginning, um, when these plants started to be established in Southern California, the cactus wren has been one of the target species for a number of these plants. And not all of these are strict NCCPs. Some of these are habitat conservation plants, but they all have um, a name of protecting the, Cali um, the coastal cactus wren. I might have said gnat catcher there. I slipped up if I did. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about, and this is where it takes a regional approach, is where I feel like we really got movement on starting to understand this species better was with the initiation of the Cactus Wren Working Group. And this was back in 2008. Trish Smith with the Nature Conservancy is the chair and the chief organizer of that. And that group uh, established a goal to identify, based on the best available science, conservation actions to ensure the persistence of the Cactus Wren in Southern California. And that includes from uh, Ventura County down to the border in San Diego and east into Riverside and San Bernardino counties. And representatives on this working group include the NCCPs, um, wildlife agencies, landowners, managers, military bases, um, local governments, scientific organizations, the USGS, and um, even um, biological consulting firms and nonprofit organizations. So a large number of players. 
And um, what I like to call Team Coastal Cactus Wren, this is not anything official, but this is even a larger group that in the last five years have really been working on this issue. It's a broader group because it includes a lot of um, property owners and individuals that may not make it into the working group. And uh, the reason I think that this collaborati collaboration has been necessary is because this is just um, the problems with the Cactus Wren are too big for any one single entity to be able to, um, to solve or to... Um, to handle um, in terms of coming to grips with what we need to do with management. So I'm going to give a nod out to um, the members of this group just so that you can see all the players and um, recognize that there are so many of them. Okay. So we have the working group itself, which many of these organizations are members of, the wildlife agencies, and I have to say that we've gotten great support for some projects from the Department of Fish and Wildlife through local assistance grants. And then also through staff support, um, there's been um, surveys and a lot of GIS support. We also get a lot of support from the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and, and um, they provide funds to the department to do these surveys. And um, so that's been really key in getting to where we are today. So we have all the multiple species conservation plans and the um, organizations that implement them. And then this is huge, but these are all the land managers or landowners and managers that have been involved in some way or the other. Now, some of them, it might just be getting access to property to survey, but that's a big deal, you know, going and looking for a species that's sensitive on habitat. And they've been giving that um, a number, but many of them are much more involved in that. They're doing active restoration. They're doing their own projects. They're organizing volunteers. They're providing staff. So, you know, there's a lot of support on this page. Okay. And then the final um, comes from individuals and organizations that may not be landowners, but they may be the um, researchers or the contracting biologists or um, not NGOs that are going out there to, to solve this problem. Okay. So what I'd like to uh, is good news. We've made a lot of progress um, since the 2008 working group meeting um, through the Team Co Coastal Cactus Run, because it hasn't all been strictly through the working group. We've uh, determined the distribution and abundance of cactus wrens in Southern California. So we now have a lot of information on where they occur from, what, uh, from Ventura, which was uh, unknown um, until just recently, through L.A. and down here into San Diego. We've documented the effects of catastrophic wildfire, and I'll be going through an example of that in Orange County. We've assessed threats to reproduction, dispersal, and survival, and, that's, uh, and population persistence, and that's... Uh, particularly what I will be talking about in the most today. We've also, uh, through uh, grants from the Department of Fish and Wildlife and through the San Diego Association of Governments, evaluated the population and genetic structure across the range of the Southern California population. And this is really key. This is probably one of the most important things we can do to define um, what we need to do in terms of management, in terms of our approach. And finally, we've de developed and tested management techniques and I see I left a little bit off of there. Um, uh, the, I'm going to end up with what we're doing here in San Diego County going forward in the next uh, five years. So um, I guess I didn't leave off with that. I have it here. I just sort of repeated slides. I, I won't be talking about all of that today. I'm going to condense it down to the effects of the catastrophic wildfire in Orange County, talk about, as I mentioned, the monitoring study, and only give you a teaser on the genetic stuff. You've got to get the real geneticists out here to talk about it and give you the full talk. And then I'll talk a little bit about management actions and the current distribution and status in Orange County, I mean in San Diego County. Okay, so this is, um, this is a view of, of fairly nice habitat in Orange County, very lush, that hasn't burned. Uh, the Nature Reserve of Orange County is um, a coastal central um, natural community conservation plan for that area. It was the first established in this region in 1996, and it conserves about 37,000 acres, um, divided between a coastal reserve and a central reserve. The I-5 um, runs right up between them, so this is the coastal and the central. And it conserves roughly 4,100 acres of cactus scrub. And in 1992, the surveys indicated that there was almost 700 sites with cactus wren. So you're probably thinking, why are we even worried about this species? 
Well, in 1993, before the plan was enacted, but right after the surveys, there was a large-scale wildfire in the central re or the coastal reserve called the Laguna Fire and it, Laguna Canyon Fire, and it burned 75% of that preserve. And that preserve hadn't burned in a long time, not in recorded history, at least to that extent, that largest scale. And then in 2007, the Santiago Fire burned 75% of the central reserve at the same time as the rest of Southern California was burning that burned. And what we can see here in the coastal reserve, we went back and mapped cactus scrub 13 years after the fire in 2006. And then we did surveys for cactus ran in 2006 and 2007. Now that had been done, they had been doing a lot of surveys prior to that and had noticed some recovery, but then had noticed a decline starting in about 2002, coincidental with that big drought. And what um, the, what Milan Mitrovich and Rob Hamilton estimated in their analyses, they did some GIS analyses, they estimated that there were 2,300 acres of cactus scrub still in the coastal reserve, but about almost 60% of it was unsuitable because it was just too short. It hadn't grown back 13 years after the fire, which is just pretty amazing. And only 187 acres were occupied. Uh, they didn't have real good numbers for the population in 1992 because that was when GIS was just getting started and, you know, it was hard to tell what a site was. But they estimated, based on area, that was about an 87% decline in occupied habitat. In the Central Reserve, uh, when it burned, the same thing happened. Um, we went out, though, right away and mapped the cactus and mapped the severity of the burns and um, looked for burns. And we found that there were 1,855 acres of cactus. Again, 77% 77, 77 burned. We thought there was close to 700 acres suitable for wren because it was lightly or moderately burned. But there was only 67 territories. And that was an estimated, based on earlier numbers, 82% decline. But the big problem is, is that we were seeing a decline not only in areas that burned, but in areas that didn't burn. So in this figure, it's a little hard to see the pink, but on here, the fire perimeter is here in red, and these pink um, ovals are where we lost occurrences of cactus wren um, from the fire. But in blue are where we had populations blinking out by 2007. So, and there's some others that you can't see off the screen. So that was the question that um, really drove us in, in 2009 when we realized that we were coming down to really low numbers in our coastal reserve. We were down in the 20s that we knew about of Rand's pairs. And, you know, from 691 sites, which were largely in the coastal reserve, well, they were distributed between both, but the coastal reserve used to have a lot of pairs. So we wanted to know why they were declining, and so we started a pilot study. And that continued um, through 2011 and was funded by a, um, a local assistance grant for two years, partially funded. And then we continued some monitoring after that. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So there's potential reasons why the cactus wren might be declining, even in, in unburned areas. And this could be because of low productivity, so they aren't producing very many young. So productivity, I'm using that term here, is the number of fledglings per pair per year. That's really what matters. It's not how many nests they do, how many nestlings they have. It's how many they actually get out the chute. And then even more important is how many of those actually survive to breed. And we'll be talking about that. So food limitation can really affect productivity, as can nest predation for birds. Those are two primary drivers. We also wanted to look at survivorship of both the young and the adults. And that can be driven by predation and disease. Also food availability, too. I think more with these droughts, that could be a factor. And then we wanted to look at the effect of isolated small populations. Um, what we were seeing is local extinction, and we, we theorized that they're not dispersing well between uh, populations and recolonizing or helping um, these small uh, populations to recover. And then finally, maybe there's just not enough habitat. Maybe it's not the right composition or structure. So our objectives were to, uh, to monitor how um, how individuals did in terms of productivity and how they survived. And we wanted to look at dispersal and how the young recruited into the breeding population. And we wanted to identify threats to the persistence of cactus wrens in these populations on our preserve. And then uh, we were um, really got involved in collecting genetic material um, for um, looking at connectivity 
and taxonomic analyses, and this was particularly in the last couple years of the study when USGS was doing their study. We did collect feathers before from adults, and that turned out to not work very well. So my recommendation for anybody that's handling birds, if you're handling nestlings, feathers are great. They got pulp. But if you're ha handling adults, just take a toenail or a, a toe clip, not pulp, toenail, and, you know, get your blood sample that way. But if you've got a bird in the hand, you should get uh, – genetics can, are so powerful now, I would ne absolutely not just ban a bird and not take genetics if I was doing a study like this because the insight is just outstanding. And it's really not that much to process. It's more the analysis that takes time. So we did – quite extensive effort looking back on it, considering how many birds we had in unburned habitat. Uh, in 2009, we started out with 34 territories at five sites, and that was our pilot study. In 2010, with the advent of additional funding, we expanded to uh, 50 territories at nine sites. 2011, the number of birds increased, so we had 60 territories, breeding territories. 2012, we then cut everything way back and just focused in on the coastal reserve although we still did um, surveys, which I'll talk about in a moment, for dispersal out in the Central Reserve. And then in 2013, we even um, we just focused on the Coastal Reserve. Throughout this period, we always did surveys periodically, a couple, uh, every season, uh, like every four months, um, and in the breeding season every month, uh, we did surveys of all nearby sites as well as our monitoring sites. And we banded almost 700 birds. Almost 100 were adults. About 500 were hatch years, and then the remainder were birds that we didn't monitor. We just banded and got genetic material. Those were birds that were in the burned area. So what you can see from this graph, this is the number of territories on the y-axis uh, y and the year on the x-axis. And you can see we don't have complete records for every site. Sometimes that's because there were no birds at a site. Sometimes that's because we had to stop sampling at a site because of our you know, funding or whatever. There was a lot of changes. But the really thing that ought to drive you is there's two populations way up here that have anywhere from 12 to 20-something territories, and they fluctuate a little bit. This is the central reserve. Down here is the coastal reserve, and all of our sites were like five or less. And when I say a site, that's like a canyon. It's distinct from the surrounding areas. They have to travel a little bit to get to the next site. They might have to travel several kilometers. It might just be one kilometer, but they've got to they've got to move. So these are not these are distinct populations that can blink in and out. So now I'm going to talk about measuring productivity. This is a cactus wren. We tend to band them at about eight days of age, between um, seven and eight. Okay. So productivity, uh, based on work that I've done previous to this, um, looking at a food ex um, experiment with wren tits and looking at um, the sex of predation versus uh, food supplementation um, and actually supplemented the predator to get it to not eat the wrens, so had a, 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 a four treatments there, found that uh, food limitation in our environment is just as important predation, and, and even in a really bad food year, predation is just as important as um, food limitation. So these birds are getting a double whammy in drought years because, you know, there's not as much food and they're also getting depredated at the nest. And so we speculated that that might be happening with the cactus wren, particularly since you'll notice here, since 1999, as circled in red, 11 of the 15 years were below average rainfall, and some of those were considerable droughts in 2002, 2007, and more recently. And this is, this is a record from, um, this is the number of inches of rain and bio-year rainfall, so that's actually the rainfall from August 1st through uh, uh, July 31st of the next year. So it's, it's, it's following the growing cycle rather than the calendar year. And you'll see it's all over the place, but we really did hit um, in the late 90s quite a um, period of drought we've had a number of years. We've had, also had some good years, but and we had, knew nothing about how predation was affecting these birds. Okay. Um, so this is our study design. Uh, this is the coastal reserve. Blue is where we actually monitored reproduction and dispersal. Red is where we went to look for dispersing birds. And, and I'm sorry, blue, we also man monitored survival. And you'll notice that the central reserve, we only have two sites. They're widely separated. That's because all of that center site burned. And this is um, the number of fledglings per pair per year. And these are the years on the um, 
x-axis, and um, these are different sites, and you can see it's all over the place in terms of the number of young they were produced. And it looks like over there in 2013 that one site's doing really well. But no, really, they're really doing lousy. It's just there's one pair left that's just going gangbusters, but we lost the other five pairs that were always at that site. So this is a little misleading. It's not um, adjusted for the number of pairs. Okay, so what I did was I um, went and did some modeling to try to figure out what, what factors could be um, influencing this productivity. And so I looked at cactus rent, I, and I'm not going to go through and explain how I calculated these, or we'd be here all night or all day. But if after um, I'm done you want to ask specific questions, we can come back to this slide. You're more than welcome to. Um, cactus wren density, the date of the first egg lay, uh, predators. So we, we kept a record of predators, so the proportion of different types of predators, whether they be nest predators or adult predators. Landscape ma matrix calculated from GIS, the percent of urban within a kilometer, coastal sage grub how much cactus was within 200 meters, which tends to be a good uh, for, uh, for these sites. The cactus really around the territory in the nest, 25 meters. Precipitation during different seasons. The minimum temperature during different key periods of the nesting cycle, as well as the average maximum temperature. And then some topographical, and I won't talk about, we did the normalized difference in the vegetation index to see if productivity as reflected by satellite imagery might be a factor. And I'm not also going to talk about the modeling methods, but I'd be glad to later. Um, the problem with our data set is it's spatially clumped, really spatially clumped. You can see that. And it's also temporally correlated uh, because we're, we're measuring the same pairs over time in this, um, and, you know, at a site the same years. So what we did is we tested to see if that was indeed the case using ArcGIS, and yes, it was. So then we had to use a modeling technique called general least squares regression that can handle this covariance between spatial and temporal data. And it's really cool. I've never done this before, um, and it, it worked out really well. It's a little complicated to understand, but it's really easy to do. <laughs> and so we have different correlation structures, and then we, um, and we ran the models using those different ones to see one which might explain it the best. And then we used the information theoretic approach to compare among models. And one model came out far better than all the others. I still have a little bit more work to do. This is uh, sort of in progress. But this model here, um, which involved a number of variables that include a year, the density of pairs within the occupied cactus, the proportion of corvids, which is jays, uh, crows, and ravens, the date of first egg lay, January to April precipitation, so just that precipitation during the growing season, not during the winter, um, or, you know, the early winter, fall winter. Minimum January and February temperature, elevation, topographical heterogeneity, which tells you how much um, uh, structures in the topography, how many, you know, different slopes there are and stuff, and the percent of cactus within 200 meters. That model is 500 times better than the next model down. So it worked pretty well, um, okay? But I wanted to show you what the effects of the most important variables. Not all of those variables were important, but the, some of the ones, the one that was by far the most important, and this is sort of a no-duh, is the number, a minimum number of fledglings versus the date that the first egg was laid. And the reason for that is when you're looking at passerine birds, really the, the thing that, uh, that really defines productivity is how many broods can they get out? How many can, because one brood can only hold a range of maybe three to four to five, but if you get two broods, then you might have anywhere from four to ten. So the magnitude of difference is the more, the more you can group, groups of young you can raise in a year, the better. So the birds that start earlier tend to raise more young than the birds that start later, and it accounts for about a difference of almost three fledglings. We're using fledglings as the unit here. Another thing that was really important was the January-April precipitation. That made a difference of about one fledgling. That The more precipitation you had during this year period that we were measuring them, the better off they did. Okay? And then um, they tended to be do a little bit better at higher elevations, and that's pretty much driven by the um, one of the inland sites. 
And then they didn't do real well when you had a large proportion of corvids in the area. That knocked off the fledgling on average. So now I'm going to talk about a little bit how are they sur surviving um, the young, in particular, dispersing and recruiting as breeders. Not very well. Of the 438 wrens where we really followed them all the way through and, and um, we knew a lot of, uh, where well, we followed them through and they weren't during the last year of our study because we haven't done 2014 monitoring, so I had to exclude those. But of the 438 wrens that we banded as hatch years, which means we banded them in the nest, only 22% survived till the following March 1st, the start of the breeding season. About 20% died as nestlings, so that's not actually not very bad, and that's probably because cactus wrens build their nests in cactus, and so they don't have as high a predation as something like a California gnat catcher would have. A lot of them disappear at the fledgling stage, and you might say, oh, they're just going and uh, dispersing somewhere else. And we probably missed a fair number, but I don't think we missed very many, particularly not in the coastal reserve, because we covered that we covered sites that didn't have wrens repeatedly, and eventually we, we would pick them up. Now, they do something that's called floating, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So sometimes you might miss them for a little while, but when we actually went back and looked at survivorship based on detectability and just a real crude analysis, it was up about 90% per year, or 95. So we're, we're getting most of the fledglings. We're not picking them up three years later very often. So what's happening here is a lot of them, something's going on here early in their, after they get out of the nest, and that's fairly common. Um, there was a few that disappeared uh, right before the breeding season, and that might be because they were dispersing, or um, and, and there's not very many, or probably just you know random didn't survive. So about 22% survived to breed uh, to, to the next breeding season. Okay. And where do the ones that survive? Where do they go? 80% 80, 80 of them stay at the same site that they were born, so they don't go very far. You know, you're talking less than a couple hundred meters. They're establishing a territory near their parents or somewhere in that vicinity. Um, and in fact, about 25% stay right in their natal site and, and wait for a va vacancy to show up. And um, only about 22% actually go to another site that can be a kilometer or many kilometers away. So these are sort of the stats on how well they recruit into the breeding population. So 90% of those 22% of, um, or those 96 birds that survived out of the 438, 90% of those survived, uh, surviving to the next breeding season actually obtained a territory. So that's the good news. They actually get established. 32% of those were what we call floaters. They just sort of hung around until they could get a territory. So it doesn't mean that they got a territory right away. They may have had to wait a year. They may have had to hang out with a adults are on the fringe of other territories. And when they do that, sometimes they can help the, uh, the adults in that territory, and sometimes they can hinder them. Um, there could be polygyny going on. We don't know where some of these young are, are, um, are involved in um, either dumping eggs, that would be the polygamy, or polygyny where the, uh, the males might be um, uh, siring young. We don't know, but we're hoping to find that out from genetics. Um, 85% of that original 96 birds eventually obtained a mate. And then 80% of 60 banded hatch years. So we, not all of them could we determine if, we, um, if they nested successfully because we did, couldn't follow them through time. Because you remember I, in 2012 and 13 we reduced some of our efforts. But 80% of the 60 that we followed for a couple years eventually were successful, though not always in their first year. And then on adults, 68% of the adults we think died during the study. And I say we think because there's actually some moving around, mostly females, but there's some moving around um, uh, after they've established, after they've bred one time, they might move around somewhere else. Uh, but we're pretty sure they died, particularly in the coastal reserve, because again, we are not finding them on all our surveys of the areas outside our monitoring sites. Twelve of these cases, about 13%, are, we know are divorced. It's where a female left the male or the male kicked her out, and it's usually the female leaving. And often another female would be in there, a younger female, with what we tended to see. Um, 
there's other also cases where females would leave the male raising the young and go off and have another brood in that breeding season. That happened a couple times too. So there is some choice going on here, and it could be related to habitat quality and mate quality. It, we don't know. We don't have quite enough data to make that determination. Um, let's go right back just a sec. Twenty adults move to a new territory um, because of a loss of a partner or because of divorce, and seven of those percent of those um, seven of those adults moved to a new site altogether. And we had one female that kept crossing the SR73, which is like a, a major toll road, which they do cross pretty well in certain spots. And uh, she, in the course of three years, had three different mates, and they were all about six, eight kilometers from each other. And she actually made uh, forays back to her original mate, and he had another female a couple of times and hung out. So she was really interesting. Okay. Secret life of birds. <laughs> this is adults, and I don't have it for the, uh, the juveniles yet. We're still working up our dispersal data. But what this is, the proportion of males or females that uh, disperse and the distance that they go. And you can see most of them go less than uh, 0.33 kilometers, 330 meters. There's a few out here that go all the way out to 10, 11 kilometers. Okay. Then I want to talk about how you can lose a population really quick. Remember I had that one slide where I said, don't get excited about that high productivity. It's one pair going gangbusters and all the others are disappearing. Well, this is the site. This is a site that stayed fairly stable between 2006 and 2011 at five to six territories. And then it started to decline at the end of 2011 after the breeding season. And by 2013, there was one pair. Um, we, we speculate. We don't have hard evidence. We do have some evidence, but we don't have enough to say unequivocally, but we think it was Cooper's hawk. And the reason that we think that is, um, cactus wrens are very vulnerable to Cooper's hawks. We would, um, when we were banding adults, we would play the tape and we could attract in Cooper's hawks. They would per come in, fly in. They, at this particular site, the density of nesting Cooper's hawks increased, and what they would do is they would sit up high in the eucalyptus off-site and could look down slope, and then they would just swoop down, and the cactus wrens wouldn't see them coming. So we did discover some, um, it, uh, some dead juveniles. Um, we got their bands and everything, the remains, because uh, well, we saw the Cooper's hawk eating them. Um, and we saw a number of attempted attacks, and then we had a case where there was one territory that just kept, kept getting hit, and it went through about five adults within a period of a month and a half, and eventually they all disappeared. So it's circumstantial, but we, this isn't the only site, but this is the worst site. Then the other thing that's probably going on is habitat quality, and I think this is a huge issue. So it's hard to see here. If you could press the button again, it might show. Okay, that's good. That's open ground. Cactus wrens forage on the ground, and they love to forage under cactus and under shrubs and, and in bare spots. You push it again, you'll see that's not so good. That's um, brachypodium, um, false, uh, purple, purple false brome, and then up there. And you can see those, are, those sites are no longer very good for foraging, and we do not know the effect that that grass is having on the um, arthropods there that they rely on. And so we started a study. I don't know what the status is, but it was done in conjunction with UC Irvine where we were actually um, plotting out where the birds were foraging, getting fecal samples from the um, young to put through. Um, it's called uh, barcoding, genomic barcoding, where you just throw a sample in and it fits out all of the species it detects in the sample. And we were trying to coordinate, uh, and then um, UCI was, was sampling the vegetation, the grass, the mustard, and everything, and we were going to try to correlate that data to see what the communities of arthropods were in these various plants, and then to see what the cactus wren were eating, and that is ongoing. And then the other thing that's a real problem in the coastal reserve and is also a problem in San Diego is, if you want to press this, you see right here, this is crowding out. This, these shrubs are crowding out this cactus, if you want to print. Here's cactus in here that's no longer suitable for netting. It's getting overtopped by vegetation, as is in that case there. So those are no long, that's wasted cactus. And, um, you know, that's pretty good mature cactus, but it's, it's not functional for nesting. Okay. 
So finally, what's affecting productivity? Well, we talked about it already. Uh, productivity is low. It's associated with the time of egg laying, how much rainfall they're getting, elevation, and corvid. Corvid impacts vary by territory, so you tend to find scrub jays are the primary cause. So those territories on the edge near people's houses get hit the hardest because most cactus scrub doesn't have a lot of cor uh, jays in it unless it's near a riparian. Uh, but we did also notice that crows and ravens were taking an interest in some of these nests at certain times and seemed to be attacking from the top and pulling the top off. So if, if you're ever checking nests, you have to be very careful and look for corvids. Nest predation was moderate um, as 80% of the nestlings survived. The floater strategy is probably really important to recruit um, young uh, individuals into the population, but it could also result in polygyny and helpers at the nest. And we actually did see helpers at the nest related individuals where young of an older brood were helping to feed young of a younger brood and also um, helping to protect the nest. Food appears import, important based on rainfall, uh, but we, and also, I, um, oh, I'll talk about, I didn't talk about that. We had delayed nestling development in a number of territories where um, the age at which we actually um, knew that they hatched and the age that they were developmentally was delayed and the weights were delayed. So we do think based on that, that food's important as well as the rainfall. And finally, habitat quality could affect the productivity. Okay. And finally, what is threats to population persistence? Not having very many young, and that's probably associated right now with, uh, largely with drought. The survivorship is really low of young, and predation of adults and young can be high, um, and we think Cooper's hawks could be a real problem, and that could be growing because the population of Cooper's hawks are growing in our urban areas, so fragments could be really vulnerable to this. And um, high predation combined with low productivity can rapidly decrease small populations. Though if they get small, they might recover, like that population I showed you had all those, all those uh, fledglings. The problem is, is those fledglings probably won't go far, so then you'll get a lot more brother, sister, mom, uh, sibling, I mean mom, daughter, son, um, whatever. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm trying to say. You'll get a lot more of that, and in fact, we did document that as well. And then poor dispersal can limit population recovery and really has implications for genetics because they're not moving out and um, getting new genes well going in. Okay. So that brings me to this project, which I find really exciting. Dr. Amy Vandergast and Barbara Coos and, um, are the leads, and Kelly Bard did most of the analyses. And I've just been um, participating, um, providing uh, samples and models for them. So I'm only going to highlight a few results because it really should be up to them to present the body of their research. Uh, this study was initiated as a result of a connectivity workshop that we had here in San Diego. Um, a strategic plan was developed by the San Diego Management and Monitoring Association, which was funded by SANDAG. And then that genetic work was extended to the entire region, all the way up to Ventura, with the support of um, uh, the Nature Reserve of Orange County provided specimens and some contributions, and then uh, CFW provided a, la a lab grant. Okay. Oh, and I forgot to mention there's a, uh, I'm sorry, there's a um, site there that you can go and get that, re or download the report. And so the, the objective of this was to evaluate the, re evaluate the degree of um, connectivity between coastal populations of cactus wrens in Southern California used microsatellite markers. So this is going to show us a little bit more recent evolution than um, this, the older studies that have used um, my, mitochondrial DNA, which looks at really deep um, evolution. Um, we're looking within and among population uh, genetic variability. And then this was tied in with color banding, uh, both here in San Diego and then also with our, our Nature Reserve uh, project and developed 26 microsatellites, which is pretty good, hello, Cy. Um, genotyped about 350 individuals, identified um, gene pool and population boundaries, uh, was one of the goals, I'm sorry. Um, then we looked at are there limitations to movement and gene flow, measured the ge genetic diversity within aggregation, um, and looked at recent reductions in population size and environmental correlates, and then assessed whether there is a genetic break with the current sand against the subspecies boundary, and that's a real key thing there. 
So, first of all, um, if you want to do it again, there's 11 distinct genetic um, clusters between Ventura down to the border. And I won't go into a lot of detail on this. These have been further subdivided into 20 distinct populations. But what I would like you to take home from this is that our coastal reserve is no longer connected to our central reserve, and it's not surprising if you look at the I-5 corridor through Irvine. You know, it would be hard for cactus friends to get through there. The central reserve is connected all the way down to Camp Pendleton and Fallbrook Naval Weapons Station. This is the highest degree of uh, connectivity and highest degree of genetic diversity, the largest effective population size. And I'm not going to go into it, but we're having real problems with, with the number of individuals that are actually contributing to the next population among all of these populations. This one's the most robust. And then here in the San Pasqual Valley, this is by Lake Hodges, the, um, the wrens there are actually doing fairly well. They're pretty connected even up to Palma Valley, north of San Luis Rey River. But then you come down here, this is Lake Jennings. This is um, the canyons uh, like Navajo Canyon, um, north of 8. And then you get down in here into the Sweetwater uh, River. And then there, these guys are all one genetic unit. Otai population, which is just like a hop, skip, and a jump from Sweetwater, is, is isolated. Uh, and, and it looks like that there's restricted gene flow. We don't know why that is. So um, uh, they're doing a historic analysis of study skins from um, different museums, to, uh, specimens from different museums, to see if this is a, an older pattern or if this is just recent from the recent development in agricultural. Okay. So in relation to our Orange County and San Diego populations, the important thing to note is that the Central Reserve is well connected, Coastal Reserve is isolated, and in San Diego, the northern population is doing okay. It's on the military bases. San Pasqual is isolated, but there's still a fair number of birds. Though, and I won't go into details, but all of these populations have suffered genetic bottlenecks from fire, and that shows up in the genetics. And then the two southern populations, while close together, are showing little gene flow and have very small, what we call effective population size, or the number of adults contributing to the next generation, contributing genes. And then this is really interesting. This is just looking at genetic relatedness among individuals and looking at it as an effective distance, trying to look at if there are patterns, like are these individuals here more clumped and more related than these here. And the way you read this is, you look at this blue line, this is uh, the uh, genetic uh, relatedness, and where it starts to come down to this red line, that means it's neutral. There's no, uh, there's no pattern there. So what, what this is saying is, is that for the central reserve, most individuals are only going about 500 meters when they disperse to, contrib to exchange genetic material. But there's these few of these that are outliers way out here that are going 8 to 10 kilometers. And that's exactly what we saw with our uh, banding data. So that's really a, sort of a cool result, because what you're seeing is that um, most of the birds stayed close, but a few went far, and that's showing up in the genetics. And it's also been done for the Otai population, and what it shows is that their genetic dispersal is even lower than what we're getting here, which is consistent with the fact that they're all staying in the Otai River Valley. Um, and then finally, the kicker, if you want to put the, the, right now, this area below this line is considered a, dis, a different subspecies than everything above this line. Everything above this line is considered allied with the desert population. All of this is considered to be um, the uh, San Diego um, coastal cactus or San Diego cactus print. This was based on a morphological study of specimens from museums looking at how morphology changed between up here, coming down here, and into Baja. The problem was they didn't have a lot of samples in this area, so they took the difference between what they saw here and here in morphology as a distinct break when it was actually a, cline, a, a clinal change. And this has real repercussions. Well, oh, and this just shows that actually looking at the genetics, you see there's no support for that. Almost all of it um, is that this whole group here is the same within the same subspecies. There's no differentiation there at that. So 
the implications of all this is, are that cactus wrens are structured into 11 genetic structures, and it's stepping stone, sort of distance related, but it's also related to other things, which I won't go into. You have to see the regular talk. Um, it, the genetics agree with what we found in our banding study, that dispersal is relatively limited. Current subspecies designation is not supported by the genetic population structure. And only Sandagensis is considered a California Department of Fish and Wildlife species of special concern. That means those northern populations where essentially share um, many of the same genes, it looks like, are um, not being protected, but the southern ones are because of this designation. So the, there are real implications to, that, to what happens to those other populations. The ones in the southern part of um, the range are all conserved mostly under community conservation plans already. Um, and then it also indicates that until relatively recently, they, these genetic clusters were probably more connected. So their recommendation, the geneticist's recommendation, is we need to try to figure out how to connect them more. And there's a lot of you could do that through investing in um, habitat restoration in some cases, but you might also even think about exchanging eggs. We've done translocations in this uh, coastal reserve from the central reserve because we were salvaging birds that were going to be developed and, and actually showed that you could get flow, gene flow into the coastal reserve. So we could manage that if we had to. But what's unresolved is this issue of what is the status of the coastal populations. Are they a separate subspecies or are they similar to the desert? And that's been a bone of contention for a long time. Three studies have found when you look at mitochondrial DNA and you really look back a long time, um, there's no di differences until you get to Baja. So there was some signal of isolation by distance among the coastal populations. So what the, really the next thing we need to do is figure out how do the California desert populations fit into this scheme. The, uh, the cactus wren was listed for um, endangered, as an endangered or threatened species, and it was turned down because it wasn't considered a, di a different subspecies. So that's why it's important to resolve this, because we're seeing so much differentiation at the local scale that they may have been just looking way too far back. We don't know. And I just put this up because that's all the acknowledgments for the genetic study, okay? Okay, I'm, get, I'm, gonna, I'm getting close. A few more minutes. I don't know how much time I've used. Um, what actions, <laughs> am I fine? Okay. What actions are being help, uh, taken to halt the decline of coastal cactus wrens? I'm just going to talk about one that's a big deal, okay? It's cactus scrub restoration. So we're really, uh, land managers are really, um, investing a lot into trying to improve the habitat. It can in, in, um, involve trying to bolster existing populations, and I think there's a consensus that that's the best thing to do right now when you have small populations, is to try to um, increase that population rather than go establish a uh, cactus patch where there's no one so far away, because they tend to like to stick together, and so it's really important to build up these small populations, both so that they don't uh, blink out, but also so that there's more genetic diversity. Um, and it takes many years for cactus to grow, and um, so you have to take that into account. But it also, this kind of restoration also benefits, like the gnat catcher, which is a federally threatened species. So I'm just going to go through what uh, when we when I was at the Nature Reserve, we did about 27 acres of cactus scrub restoration, and what was really nice is we were able to do some large cactus restoration, and this was through some grants that we got and through um, salvaging cactus from a site that was being developed. And the large cactus provides immediate habitat. It's just very expensive. It, it requires really, um, you can't just do it with volunteers. So this is what we want to restore. This is what we want it to look like. This is where we're getting our cactus, because that's going to be made into some who knows what. Um, and that's another view of it. And, and it, there's no wrens here. It's just isolated by non-native grasses, so it's a perfect donor site. This is how we take it out. We clear the site for planting. They go through. They, they mow everything down in the fall. They take all the thatch out. It just looks beautiful when they're done, okay? You can see how it's starting to look better. And then they go and ca uh, plant it. So these really big pla plantings require, you know, backhoes and 
and uh, this is what it looks like. So you can put these in, and we do water them in, uh, or we did water them in on this project. You don't have to, but if you do, we had almost 100% survival of the large. We also would plant um, small cactus around it, pads, and that survival is not quite as high. They get really munched by, um, sometimes by, um, you know, other animals. They get um, overgrown sometimes, but the big cactus tends to do really well. And, um, okay, when you do that, we actually have nests within a month or two, not breeding nests, but roost nests. So they start using it right away. And they also love it when you, you do the, if you're in a weedy site, they come and forage where you've been um, restoring because it's so barren. And then when the first flush comes through or you have late hemazonia coming up, uh, tar plant and stuff, they just love it out there. So um, the only thing is I think they get a little bit more exposed to predation because there's not so many weeds protecting them from visibility of predators. Okay. Finally, home stretch. What is the current status of cactus wrens in San Diego County, and what are we going to do moving forward in terms of management? So this is um, data that was collected between 2008 and 2013. Some of it's data that Department of Fish and Wildlife has collected recently for the, um, for the range-wide surveys. Some of it's data that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Clark Winchell was in charge of collecting, and then a lot of it is data from um, the USGS when they went did, the, did their genetics. These red locations are where no cactus wrens were detected. These blue are where we've detected them in that time. And these may be, these are multiple years of observations. So I just want to caution. So you can see they're doing fairly well up here. South end of Camp Pendleton, they're starting to blink out along the I-15. But boy, in the city canyons, they're not there. The thing is, there's not a lot of historic information that they were ever right here. So we mapped all the cactus. Clark went out and mapped it all, but didn't find them in these fragments. But down in here is another story. This area really, uh, if you can go to the next one, down in the Otai, this area used to have um, a much better representation of cactus rent. And, um, and also in here, and what um, I neglected to say is that fire has played a role. Some of these have disappeared recently where there were wrens because of um, 2007 wildfires. And then down in the Salt Creek area, which is right in here, I think, oh no, right in here, there was fires in the 90s that might have um, altered some of the habitat at the north end. Remembering back to this, the genetic, so we're really concerned about these two populations. They're, they're less diverse and they show more uh, absence than um, we would like to, or non-detections than we'd like to see. Do we try to restore them, um, and do we try to connect them? Well, we've developed a management strategic plan. You can go to this website, and you can see what we're trying to do the next five years. And this is for um, a number, of, uh, if you go to the next page. Um, we have these strategic plans through the San Diego Management and Monitoring has been tasked to do this through SANDAG. And we've worked with all of our partners, the agencies, with um, uh, DMP Working Group, the Environmental Mitigation Protection Working Group. And um, the purpose of these strategic plans is to identify what we need to do to make this reserve system work as well as we can with the resources that we have. Okay. And so for the cactus wren, uh, if you want to push it again, our first of, uh, these are all our objectives, I mean our goals for a regional across western San Diego County, and then we have these management units that are subdivided, so the Otai River and the uh, Sweetwater fall into one management unit, and um, the, the Lake Hodges into another, and so on. And in these um, objectives, we've already started right now, we're working on a, a restoration plan to, to, uh, that's focusing in on the South County. And that plan is being developed um, in conjunction with uh, the Nature Conservancy. They're actually writing it, and we're, um, USGS is doing some surveys for that, and then I'm contributing um, some modeling. And then we have another, a number of other activities. We're going to create uh, cactus wren nurseries in both the south and the north part of, the, part of the county so that we can move forward with restoration. We're going to, uh, we're supporting, or I shouldn't say we, but the plan, and, and when I say we, I'm talking about the whole group again, that team, not just uh, myself or my coworkers, um, the, we're working on um, a fire plan to help protect cactus uh, wrens and their habitat. And then um, 
supporting work that the Institute for Conservation Research is doing in the San Francisco Valley. And then finally, the goal down there in 2016 is to begin um, to begin um, restoration. Or, I'm sorry, that was 2015. So we're on a fast track. And this is some modeling that we've done. This is a little bit core scale showing areas where you might potentially put cactus in relation to where wrens are. And so we're, right now we're going out and doing site evaluations to, to look at the site to figure out what might be the best site. Okay? And we're really concerned about the drought because you saw how they're not doing very well in the drought. We, we saw declines after the 2007 drought, um, immediate declines. And so we're really worried about these, these smaller populations down in the south part of the county. And um, we're worried about because of productivity, along with routine mortality and perhaps drought-related mortality, it gets pretty dry out there in August and September. One of the things that wrens tend to rely on in the summer and the fall that we've seen is, um, well, when they're in prickly pear, is the, um, is the fruits. They, they, you see a wren and they'll be purple here, just like the mockingbirds, because they're getting into those fruits, and those fruits also in attract insects. So there's a double benefit there. And if you don't have a lot of rain, then you don't get a lot of fruit. Now, for the choya, I'm not sure as much what they're, if they're using that, because those fruits aren't as good. So, you know, I don't know if there's a difference. But I know, like, if you're down in Baja and you see the cardone when they're blooming um, in uh, September, all the birds flock to those two. So these resources that bloom late in the fall may be really important for certain species. So we're worried about that. Um, and so we're trying to monitor this. We're sending a little bit extra effort and develop contingency plans. So what could we do if it looks really bad out there? And one of them is we could do supplemental feeding. We, we don't want to do that. We've done that um, in Orange County with, as part of our translocation of wrens, and it works quite effectively. They learn how to eat uh, mealworms off cactus very easily. And um, it's just we don't want to make them dependent on that. But if it comes to the point where you're down to several pairs and we don't know what's going to happen in the future, you can't get those birds back. There's nowhere we could harvest birds from somewhere else to bring them there to translocate um, them. We just don't have enough birds to do that. And that's not really a very effective way to do it, and it's really expensive. So it's better to try to keep them alive where they are at than see them um, blink out, which they have bl blinked out of some areas. We've seen that happen, so we know it can happen. And the other thing we might be able to do is reduce weeds because they invade for moisture, you know, they compete for moisture. We might be able to do a little bit of irrigation to ha enhance some productivity of insects, you know, but this is all very experimental, and that's what we would have to do to test it. But we are concerned about um, the smaller populations in the South County. And finally, in closing, finally, <laughs> it takes the entire region. I think I talked about what we're doing in San Diego and Orange County, but there's other things that are going on throughout the region. This is just a snapshot, and I think it's really important that we share information and we work together as partners so that we can come up with the, the best and most effective methods to manage these guys. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions? So, so the question was whether um, when birds disperse, is, is the distance that they go dependent on the cactus patches in the landscape? And that's an excellent question. When we started out, I thought they were. I thought that they had to jump from patch to patch. But we've learned that they can actually move through non-cactus habitat. But they need to find it eventually within their dispersal distance, and they need to find it with other wrens there in order for it to be a successful dispersal. But so, so what, that's why we're thinking right now that the best thing to do with limited resources is to expand the existing populations, and then when they get to a level that we think that they're sustainable, then we would start working on stepping stones. But those stepping stones, the cactus, need to be large enough to support 
breeding pairs. They can't. They're, in, in other words, just putting out a little bit of cactus there so that they hope they see it and go there might be a waste of that cactus. And the reason that we know that they're moving through more than just cactus is they're moving through um, co coastal sage grub, a little bit of ornamentals based on what we can see. They're moving um, through riparian. We had one bird. I don't know how many of you know where um, Upper Newport Bay is, but we had one bird, uh, the only one out of a, a number of birds that were at that site over the years, but one female left in the middle of the season, season after her male died, and she uh, went from there, crossed Jamboree at road grade, and into the SR-73 corridor. We speculate. That's the only way we can think of she went. And she moved 10 kilometers all the way over to Irvine, and none of, very little of that was cactus scrub. So we know that they can move. We're not saying that it's great, but the most desperate ones of them might be able to get through it. I mean, it would be better if it was more contiguous cactus scrub. Yes. Yeah. So that's a really good question was whether the birds tend to um, act differently in areas where they're more used to humans walking by them on trails versus areas where there might be more restricted trail use. How, how, do, how does human um, walking on these trails affect the birds? And um, it's really interesting. I don't think we have a real good handle on it. Some birds seem to be very upset by people walking by. Um, other birds, we've had them nest almost uh, lower than a meter from the ground within feet of a trail. Nobody ever noticed the nest because it was tucked in, you know, and that didn't seem to bother them. So there's a lot of individual variation, which could be explained partly by their exposure to people, the amount of exposure. It might also have to do with the individual characteristics of their habitat. And, um, you know, I don't think we have a good handle on it, but I think in general, it's, it's better for the wrens to have their nests away from the trails because, um, you know, we have had instances where people have vandalized nests and also sometimes dogs, you know, if they're down low. So I don't think dogs are going to get into cactus all that much, but, you know, that is a disturbance. It could um, uh, cause them not to uh, feed as often. They're young. So good, good question. Yes. Not in any detail, and that would be wonderful to do. Um, so our, uh, what our approach was to try to focus on starting like little concentrations of large cactus surrounded by little so that we could create more habitat because we thought that that was the need. But I think that there, it is good to have dense cactus scrub for them to nest in. So we're sort of caught between, between uh, whether we're trying to get more area uh, eventually going to be restored, and knowing that they might use it, it might not be as good as having a denser cactus. And I don't think we have a real good handle on what the nest site attributes are. We unfortunately just didn't have the manpower to go out and measure very many nests and compare uh, success versus uh, unsuccessful nests. But I do know that the Institute for Conservation Research has done some uh, work on trying to figure out not relating it to um, whether the nests were successful or even whether they were breeding nests, but just the presence of a nest, and has found some interesting um, results. And it involves, um, it involves the spacing of shrubs and the amount of bare ground and the, uh, a little bit about the cactus, and I don't remember all the details. Okay, so there's a question about whether the um, habitat suitability map that I showed is available online and whether it's dynamic. So um, the habitat map model that I showed actually um, is an old one. It's a very coarse scale. It's a one kilometer. We've just developed a new one that we're in the process of evaluating that's at 150 meter scale. And once that is all tested and I feel comfortable sending it out, 
then it will be posted on our website. I've already actually given it to DFW to use in their surveys, um, but again, it's not been tested. So that will be available. It's a static map. It, um, it just shows you what um, the environmental conditions indicate. It's sort of like what the probability are, or how likely it is for that site to be occupied. It doesn't mean that there will be birds there because there may not be cactus there. It's the conditions that are suitable for wrens and cactus. It may be highly disturbed, or there may not be birds anywhere in the area that could get there. So these models have to be taken as a prediction about where you might find suitable habitat, but not as the truth. Oh. Okay, so that was a really good question. Everybody heard it here. Do I need to repeat it for the people on the? Okay, so the question was, why are the grasses invading um, cactus scrub, and is it because of fire, or um, is, as a succession, or um, what was the last part, or was it due to? Um, is it just coming? Does it just come uh, take a long time for the cactus scrub to come back after a fire? Well, we think that um, fi not all fires are equal, and not all intervals after a fire are equal. So the conditions after a fire might affect the response. And um, some fires, so for instance, in San Diego County, and I will get to the grasses in a moment, some fires um, in San Diego County didn't have that much of an impact um, on cactus wren, and that was in the San Pasqual Valley. And if you look at the fire severity maps, it didn't burn as hot there. And they've had a good recovery. But other areas coming back after fire don't look so good, and there are a lot of grasses. So yes, grass can come in after the fire. Um, you can also get a different composition of shrubs. Um, you might get more uh, melasma, or you might get more of something else, and I think that that might have happened in the coastal reserve as the composition changed somewhat. It may be crowding out, and it may be competing with cactus for moisture. So. There's a lot of things I, I can't really say what a normal trajectory for cactus regrowth is, just not having enough experience with it. But the issue of, uh, of grasses is huge. It's coming in, they're coming into areas, too, that haven't burned. So um, grasses are uh, something that's, I think, been happening since the 90s, maybe later than that, to be a real problem in, definitely in the last decade. And um, I think that is having an effect personally. I, that's my hypothesis. So the question is, is what drives the distribution of cactus? And I'm not sure that I have all the answers, but I would speculate that it's a poor competitor. So it, um, it does well in, in places where shrubs like to be, and they'll overgrow it or they'll outcompete it. And um, so it's often in the stonier, uh, thinner soils. It, it grows well in, you know, where you sort of have um, volcanic soils and things like that. Um, and that's where you'll see it without a lot of shrub encroachment, um, but it can also be stunted in those areas as well. Um, I think in general I would agree with um, Clark Winchell had a strong feeling that it was on mainly the southeast and southwest facing slopes or, you know, southern slopes, and I think to a large degree it is, but in some cases you'll find it on maybe going down the north facing slope a little bit, and it might be that those conditions are either just too mesic or too much competition. But that, those are my guesses. I don't know. I, actually, what I'm going to be doing is um, developing models for the cactus as well as the cactus wren, because the models I have right now don't have cactus in them, because um, we were mainly looking at dispersal with those models and um, potential. But uh, we're going to do models for Choya and for Alpentia to see uh, what, um, if we can pick up any environmental relationships. Okay, that's a good question. Did we notice dis uh, dispersal distances between males and females? If you could go back to the slide that we had that showed the dispersal. I don't have the stats for that because I didn't um, refresh my memory on that. But I think it shows male versus female here. And I think in, I don't know that there's all that much difference, but I think that the females tend to take some of the longer distance post-breeding dispersals. But this is something that we haven't completely analyzed, so I'm, let's see if that, sorry, it's way back there. This is a long, oh, there it is. 
Okay, so the males are in blue and the females are in yellow. And you can see from this distribution that there's a lot of sight fidelity from the males. And that's typical in birds where the females go away and the males stay close to home um, and set up breeding territories. So it looks like this, and I don't recall what the, um, the statistics are, but it looks like the females go a little farther. I'll have to work that up. Good question. Yes. Okay, so there's a question about what's the status of artificial cactus that was being done up in um, Orange County on the Art Nature Reserve of Orange County and also on some adjacent lands by the Irvine Ranch Conservancy. And they started out making these structures that look, trying to make them look like cactus. And um, they had a lot of barbed wire and, and nasty looking pins. You wouldn't want to touch them, you know, the kind of pins that you staple specimens when you're doing dissections. Um, but those weren't really used. But then they developed another prototype that's more like a bird box that's open-ended and it's on a pole. And actually they had some uh, birds using that and reproducing in it. I don't know how many. I don't, I don't know. But the idea was to try to get a good, safe nesting spot if you didn't have enough cactus at a site to attract the wren. And, and it, it did work. I don't know how often it worked. Okay, so the question was, of the corvid species, was there any particular species that was having more of an impact on winds, and is there anything we can do to manage that impact? Um, we don't know for sure, but we're pretty sure that scrub jays were a major component. We tried doing, nests, uh, we tried doing cameras on nests, and we just had too many um, issues with that because the cactus wrens have a, a football-shaped nest that they go inside, and it's really hard to see what's going on inside. And then putting the camera outside, you, it's very difficult to set that up to actually see what's going in. So we don't have any camera data to aid us here. What we have is we have uh, situational data watching the behavior of the birds and stuff. We also have data on other species. It's well established that scrub jays are a huge um, predator of many of our local nesting birds. I, my study I did with wren tits, scrub jays were the primary predator, and the way I could reduce predation was to feed the scrub jays. So, you know, you could feed the scrub jays as a management action, but then you'd be boosting their productivity, and that's not really sustainable. So, um, you know, they, they also have had problems with the gray vireo out in the East County. That's a very, um, it's a very um, threatened bird species at this moment, and it has similar problems they've caught on camera with um, scrub jays, and these bells vireos have predation by scrub jays. You know, the list goes on and on. Um, I don't know what we can do to manage it because, um, you know, some of it could be these fragments that are supporting jays at feeders, which I'm guilty of at my house, you know, where there's, where there's uh, good foliage, where there's um, oaks, things like that. Um, well, I, I can't really answer that. <laughs> I don't know that um, that's known real well. I think that there is a consensus that the the crows and the ravens have increased and they've moved more coastal, and that could be posing a problem in areas where we, because we did, like I say, notice there were nesting um, ravens near some of the nests. And so anywhere where you have corvids near the nest, those ones seem to be more vulnerable to that. Um, but as far as jays, I, I can't answer that. I think it would be good to look at maybe some of the Christmas bird counts and see if there's any trends. <laughs> okay. So the question, yeah, the, the the question was, can we get depredation permits or permits to move the animals that might be preying upon cactus wren? Um, we haven't gone that far, but that is a potential down the line. I don't know how successful it is. You know, we've sort of got into that with um, least turn, snowy plover, and it's a huge management responsibility. It would be better if we could reduce the, um, the quality of a site for a, a Cooper's hawk. So, you know, where you, where you have fragments, I think you're sort of stuck, but where you have nice open space, maybe not having 
so you could lift the stands, you know, where they might nest if there's no oak trees around or, you know, just doing that kind of management. I think that is something that maybe you have to be considered when you have really imperiled populations. Um, I, I don't know. But you guys probably know better than me what's the effectiveness of removing a Cooper's hawk during the breeding season. Do they come back? <laughs> And other ones move in. So, you know, it is, uh, it might not be good. Uh, one thing I wanted to do when I was at the Nature Reserve was actually do a telemetry study of the Cooper's hawks, watching the wrens to see what the patterns of hunting and how big the predation pressure really was or maybe wasn't, just to see. But that's a huge undertaking. costs lots of money. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yes. So the question was, is there any um, thought of prioritizing the um, genetic study to go look at the uh, cactus wrens in the deserts? And, oh, yes, we would love to. Amy Vandergast is looking for money. She would really like to go out and um, look in the eastern part of um, beyond um, San Diego, Riverside, and um, San Bernardino counties. And what's interesting is the habitat model that I did actually shows, doesn't show suitable habitat for desert populations at all, which is really good. I wouldn't want it to because it's, it's cluing in on what the coastal birds are living off of. But it shows this whole area around Cass Steak, um, you know, up by Santa Clarita, as being suitable. And there's no wren observations there uh, in our data set. And it turns out that historically they were there and that they've been recently um, have disappeared. And so it would be really interesting to look and see at that end when you start go that transition between Santa Clarita over to the um, Antelope Valley, I think it is, to see what that connectivity is, I mean, if they're, uh, if they're, what those genetics are. But um, we'd have to work on study skins from individuals because I, I don't know that any of them are, are still extant there. But, uh, yes, we would love to, to get um, a handle on that, and we're looking into different ch types of funding sources and to see if we can get that to happen. And it wouldn't cost all that much because we have all the microsatellites processing them. Isn't that difficult? And it would be just a matter of going out and collecting the samples and then comparing them. Any other questions? Well, thank you, everybody, for your patience. That was a long talk. <laughs> So thank you, everybody, who was able to attend this talk and participate via WebEx. Thank you to the WebEx audience. Um, on behalf of the Department of Fish and Wildlife Habitat Conservation Planning Branch, and special thanks to Dr. Christine Preston for sharing this important information with us. And we certainly hope that as you continue to learn new information about this um, sensitive species that you'll come back again and talk to us uh, as part of the lecture series sometime in the future. And thank you, everybody.